afternoon, everyone. All those who haven't paid their income tax, can you please leave your room? It's a real pleasure and an honor, uh, express pleasure and honor to welcome Nishita Ram, the finance minister of India. A big round of applause. In the normal course of events, uh, the person welcoming would be presenting her with a bouquet and she would accept the bouquet graciously and then forget about the bouquet and the person who's given her the bouquet. So we thought we'd do something different, uh, which is, as the adage goes, we are what our teachers make us to be. So uh, the organizers very graciously thought of something very wonderful. The bouquet to Ms. Sita Raman, the Finance Minister of India, would be presented uh, to her by her teacher, Ms. Sabita. Can I please request ma'am? Ladies and gentlemen, as I said, it's a real pleasure and an honor for me. And I think if one were to describe uh, in one sentence uh, the job of the finance minister, uh, as the meme goes, you have one job. Her job, her one job is uh, to make India a success story. That's her one job. Now, uh, is India a success story? There are various elements to this question. And I think I want to, in whatever uh, 7 minutes and 30 seconds that I have, I want to delve into those before the floor is of uh, Ms. Sitara. I think we are. Uh, if you were to look at some parameters, for example, when we gained independence in 1947, uh, our life expectancy was 32 years. 32 years. Today it is 74 years. In 1947, our literacy rate was 12.5%. Today it is upwards of 80-86%. Our poverty rate was 71%. Today it is 4.5%. And the most troubling statistics was that in 1947, our infant mortality rate was 160, which meant that out of 1,000 babies born, 160 did not live to see one year. Today it is 24. So yes, we've made great progress. We are a success story. And if you were to scrunch the timeline from not 75 years, but to the last 10 years, I think we've been a stunning success story. Largely in no small measure because of the achievements of Ms. Sita Raman. If you were to look at a few data points, for example, in 2014, the percentage of Indian population uh, that was multi-dimensionally poor was 29%, today it's 11%. In 2014, our GDP per capita was $1,500 US dollars, today it's $2,500 US dollars. Uh, in 2014, our foreign exchange reserves were 300 billion, today they are, I think yesterday, $678 billion. Uh, so on and so forth, we had uh, metro in 5 cities, uh, now we have metro in 20 cities, 
We had 74 airports. We have 148 airports today. Um, 21,000 kilometers of railway lines were electrified today. 63,000. Uh, the length of highways that we built in 60 years prior to 2014, we built half of that length in the last 10 years. It has been tremendous progress. Uh, the AUMs at the mutual funds 10 years ago were 9 lakh crores, today it's 63 lakh crores. Uh, in 2014, we had um, 7 billion dollars of electronics exports, today it's 23 billion dollars. And most satisfying for the tech uh, people out here. In 2014, we had 350 startups. Today, we have 118,000 startups. So, yeah, I mean, we made stunning success. And if you were to crunch that timeline even further, not to 75, not to 10, but to just one year, last one year, I think we've been a spectacular success story. Uh, in the last one year alone, uh, our vehicle sales are the highest ever at 4.1 million units. Our uh, monthly GST collections are the highest ever at 2.1 lakh crores, I think it was May. Uh, our employment, number of jobs created, highest ever at 47 million jobs. We have the manufacturing PMI index, highest ever at 59.1. Uh, so many others, for example, <coughs> something that yes, is something to be proud of, income tax returns are the highest ever at 68 million. Our, um, Central government debt to GDP ratio is at a five year low of 56%. Inflation is at a five year low of 3.5%. Our inequality is at a five year low of 0.4 GD. And our Sensex is at, is at an all time high of 83,000. So, yes, from success to study, success to spectacular success. But then I ask, why is it that still? 300 million Indians earn 60 rupees a day. Why is it that 150 million children are still out of school? Why is it that 34% of all under 5 Indian children are chronically malnourished and stunted? Why is it that 20% of all poor children have never been vaccinated? Why is it that 8 million Indian children serve as child labor? Why is it that 18 million Indians are in bonded labor? Why is it that 70% of India has not seen internet access? Why is it that only 2% of adult Indians pay tax in UK at 66%? Why is it that our GDP per capita is ranked 136 behind Sri Lanka and even Bangladesh? So yes, the glass is filling. The glass is half full or half empty, depends on how you look at it. But if there is one person who will make sure that this glass keeps on filling and fills to the brim, ladies and gentlemen, the onus is on Mr. Sitaram. Mr. Sitaram, please. start on something like if you've not had your income tax file get out of this room. In the same way, I'd like to tell him not to see me for the next three, four days because it can be projected as how dare you, Anand, come and apologize to me. <laughs> that would be the projection saying I've called it to apologize to Anand, stay away from me for a whole week. Um, no, actually, I think it's uh, the introduction is a very fair way of putting what we have probably together, people of India and the political leadership and the administrations in various states have achieved. But even so, there are so many fundamental things which still have to improve. There's no way in which you can look the other way when these data are spread before us. So, in a forum like this, and also from the finance ministry, 
it's very difficult to just talk on specifics and also to talk on what could be done immediately to address this because it will have its own implication of oh the finance minister has committed on this, how much would she give? So I'm going to talk a bit on the larger issues and then probably address one or two of these uh, concerns. We can never forget the fact that it is the efficiency of governments which delivers on fundamental ground realities. Whether it's malnutrition, whether it is the number of schools with quality teachers, whether it is measuring the outcome in schools, each grade for its learning outcomes and so on. It, it is a question of how governance is taken down to the last point. The difference between our government, and I'll take the name of the Honorable Prime Minister, the difference between a governance under an experienced Prime Minister as opposed to experience maybe, but uh, let's say the dedication and the kind of commitment for the national cause being very different, the outcomes can also be different. So sometimes we say 45 years of one party rule but has not delivered, Whereas 10 years of what Prime Minister Modi has delivered is so clearly before us and so on. The cutting edge difference is if the commitment is I have to deliver on every point rather than be at the top, be from the front, but down below and on the specifics, each one does it so his own or her own, even with the intentions being good. So the difference in this approach is from the time of a particular section has to be addressed or a particular scheme has to be launched. Prime Minister Modi's uh, operational, uh, which all of us have understood and we work with him on that, is from the time you conceive a project to the time it is completely taken to saturation point on the ground, he monitors it continuously. So it will look as if some people might comment, does he micromanage? It's very difficult to begin. But he does, because that is the stuff he's made of. And he thinks he needs to be clear that it is progressing towards the outcome that he had laid out at the beginning. There's no good announcing it, no good putting money there, but you have to see that it uh, operationalizes. So when you're taking this approach, your outcomes can definitely be read out like the way Anand did. But if I were to do it, they'd say, okay, she's come with the most about what she has achieved in the last couple of years, but I'm sorry, uh, so that will not be accepted. I can quite understand that. But today what Anand has done is what many of the media and also many of the observers are doing if they have that thought, but if they have a different kind of an agenda, obviously they'll not speak about it. But it is necessary, therefore, to recall what India has achieved in the last few years particularly in the last 10 years, only because this has been possible only with a government which has remained absolutely beyond corruption. Not an element of corruption in anything that we do. No pecuniary advantages, no policy distortions, no subjectivity anyway. Any scheme, everybody gets it. Any scheme, transparent process. Any tendering of jobs, it's all through the global tendering process. It's out in the digital whatever. Whenever somebody bids, it's all known immediately. So there is no way there is a hidden you know, agenda of some people like to make their money and therefore any number of calls or allegations that you only favor, let's say 1A or the other A, I don't want to take names here, are all calls of frustration, calls coming out of frustration because you are just not able to say anything about this government that it is corrupt in its, let's say, moral values, corrupt in its uh, pecuniary interest, corrupt in its way of doing business. No. And therefore they keep saying. That is why it is important when you collect all the achievement lists, when you provide houses, when you provide drinking water, when you provide medical insurance, for up to 5 lakhs to uh, individual in a family and uh, within a year, to a family in a year. 
these are not uh, benefits going to big businesses. These are, after all, reaching the common citizens. And when I bring in concessions or uh, rates which are different in uh, income tax, particularly in the new regime, and I make it a point to make sure that I give the standard deduction uh, enhancement within two years of having brought the new regime, it is because we want to make sure that the benefit goes to the salary in the middle class rather than to, you know, I've given great reduction, but it will benefit everybody till the high net uh, worth individual, and therefore I've given for middle class, but I'm sorry, it also goes to the high net worth. That is the structure of the rates and the slabs in income tax. But if I have to particularly give something to the middle class, that's where I'll increase the standard deduction. The rates are also changing, but that will be applicable for everyone who declares a personal income. So these kind of constantly looking and pairing out interests and sections for whom there is a requirement of having to extend some kind of assistance, we go that far and do it. So when we talk in great detail, it becomes like your communication is poor, yeah? you're talking too much technicalities. This is not the way to go about it. You have to say in simple terms, I've given you a thousand crores for only distributing between, you know, those of the age of 10 and those of the age of 25. No, we don't do that. And that is why this debate about freebies acquire a dimension and we are most often told, even you are engaging in freebies. No, we are not engaged in freebies for two reasons. One, we understand the section for which we have to give it. Two, in the states where we are providing, we clearly understand the state's financial situation and we clearly say the scheme will be subject to the assembly and passing it through the budget. And therefore the freebies are not fancy uh, cuckoo land uh, decisions which have no collaboration with the state's own policies. So that's, that's going through the process and states which have rushed into giving these kind of promises are today facing severe crisis. I don't need to name them, you know, you are aware for states which promised returning to the old pensions. When you can't sustain, and that is why today with a committee of experts talking with uh, stakeholders, we have come up with a unified pension scheme. So the reason why I have gone to giving you these examples is to say quite a lot of mind application happens at every stage. It is not left to just say one section of the administration, everybody and also the stakeholders are brought in and decisions are taken by them. So therefore, where are we now? The list of achievements, which the list of what has been achieved in the last 10 years and particularly in the last one year, particularly in the last five years, are all very briefly presented before you by Anand. But I want to say two things about what India is facing today and two things about where we are better off than many others. We are better off because there is a sense of continuity. Like it or not, and all of us may, at least some of us may agree, could the number be better, could the number have been better. But the fact remains, it is Prime Minister Modi who has formed the government for the third time successfully. So that brings in an element of continuity, stability in policy. And therefore, the priorities which are make sure that India is safe, make sure the Indian fundamentals are strong, make sure you know the destination where you have to go, and therefore the path there has to be laid out for all of us to benefit it, benefit from it. And that is why for a moment I'd like to go back to talking about the global situation, the uncertainties, the rapid changes in regime. Fifty countries have had their elections this year, or some going through now. Changes are happening rapidly. And in that process, uncertainty is set in because the newer agenda of the new winning party is again going to reset the country's priorities and in that sense, India has been fortunate. And therefore, the priority that Prime Minister Modi gives for national security, particularly because I borrow some of one of my friend's words, 
no nation can be secure in isolation. You cannot say I've built a very strong armed forces, it is well endowed, and therefore I'm going to be very safe. No. Today you need to have friends, you need to have such alliances, otherwise you're just going to will not have enough helping hand if there is a contingency arising. You need to have uh, situations where we will stand up for your cause. For this, I'd like to just say how traditionally, even traditionally, non-aligned countries had, which have, you know, which led to a downsizing of their militaries, have today realized that they have to buck up, they have to have defenses, they have to have this economy is being strong as much as money is for setting up their defense in a stronger way. So, in the early 2000s, and from then to now, you find a lot of reset happening. Countries are looking at their own national security. Even countries like Sweden, countries like Finland, yes, they are closer to some big country, but never mind, they felt safe all the while, but now they believe that they need to strengthen their defense, uh, you know, structures. And as a result, ideally, not a good thing, but as a result, global military expenditure grew 7% to 2.43 trillion US dollars in 2023. And that's the steepest annual rise which has happened since after 2009. So the sense of security, longing for peace, and overall security considerations now being very fragile. Countries think they have to get back to speak safer, well armed, well you know positioned. Poland's military spending, 14th highest in the world now, was 31.6 billion after growing by 75% between 22 and 23. This is by far the largest annual increase in any European country. So countries are now spending money to keep themselves safer and uh, well endowed from the point of view. So if you are looking at what the future entails for India and how we are going to reach that destination of Vikasit Bharat by 2047, we are on the right track in that we prioritized on our national security. We have never compromised on spending on defense. Although you know the kind of uh, whimsical uh, 10 years which lasted earlier, where they didn't, at one point in time, didn't have money to spend on defense. At the point in time, they said, no, our older villages are better off without spending money on them because if they're very good, you know, the enemy can walk in easily. All those things happen, but we have never compromised it. Whether it is a simple thing, but a very critical thing for an individual soldier, a bullet to vest. Even that has been attended to, and to the extent of getting larger vectors, which are so required either for the Navy or for the you know, arm, Army and so on. So this sudden uh, worry about global security, and individual countries no longer wanting to be that ideally non-aligned. They may still continue to be non-aligned, but they want to be from a stronger position, from a bolder position, from a position of being sure that they are well armed for it. That is what is the spirit of Atmanirmar Bharat announcements which were made in 2020 in the context of COVID. So I just want to underline the fact that we need to be conscious of the fact that when you are measuring a country's development today, I suppose as much as any other time, but there was a period of lull. We thought the world has arrived at a formula through which Largely all of us are going to be safe and there's no worry for us to think in terms of you know, being very ready for defensive positions. So your measurement for being developed is not going to be devoid of your defense capabilities. Developed doesn't mean that I do everything right for our population, which is important. Everything right for you know getting education, getting health and so on, which is right, which we need to do but we also have to be at least safeguarding our national interest, which includes 
security interests. So self-sufficiency, factors of vulnerability being addressed, and taking sure, making sure that the external actors and their impact on us will be manageable. So with these things, we take position. We need to build institutional capabilities, which is look at the strength of our banks, which is look at the infrastructure that we have, whether the border posts or within the hinterland, whether your companies and their health is good, whether they have good exit and entry policies, and above all, what has made a big difference to India, particularly in its economy, particularly in bringing all sections towards the mainstream of the economic activity, is digitizing our Indian economy. That's revolutionized. What several governments over 50 years couldn't achieve has been achieved because of the way we spread the digital infrastructure and much without nudging, without having to uh, you know, empower people or to tell them that this will give you benefit. People have walked into this world of digital you know, activity. And as a result, you find the economy has got the strength from below and little wheels are moving making the giant wheel easy to do. So that achievement in the digital will also have to be strengthened. So you have to have institutional capabilities strengthened, and that's what is going to make the Indian economy be a lot more sure of how to move forward. Again, the question of inclusivity. It is not just a norm or an ideal or a, you know, a, in a country with disparity, that has to take precedence over self-sufficiency or Atmanirbhar. It is important for very many other reasons as well, but it is important for every country. So you need to strengthen financial inclusion. You have to get more people on board so that they can benefit by the banking services and also see where they can acquire that little credit to run their businesses. Then you need to have targeted welfare delivery. I want to hear the little sensational position. And I'm sure many in this audience would question me saying, why do you want to say this? Because I've heard voices coming, which are slightly good, saying, why is it that you still have to feed 80 crore people by taxing the middle class? I want to humbly submit. I want to humbly submit. But reducing the burden of taxation is one thing, which I will have to address. And I can see more can be done. I will try to make it more. But you can never compare it saying, I'm paying taxes, it is only for the safety code to get free food. Sorry, I reversed that. Pardon me for that. Yes, you can question about efficiency in delivery. Yes, if you can question, is it 80 crore or is it less or is it more? all worthy questions we need to have to address and that's where hopefully when the census happens we've heard the home minister say that sooner in comments we'll get the actual data and we'll be able to do it but till then for us to think there is some other idea with which 80 crore is being kept up i think we need to sit back for a moment pause and then talk talk about it i've just taken this opportunity to bring that element in but targeted welfare delivery, whether it is for medical, whether it is for health, whether it is for food, whether it is for children's education, whether it is for overall well-being of the family, we need to do targeted welfare delivery. And digitization, as I said, an economy needs to have more and more formalization. What sounded a bit of a sweet music in uh, years when I said the number of people who pay tax, it can be better. And it is not for want of earning, but probably it is in such a fashion that people come in and it trickles, the income tax net will have to be widened. The tax net in general will have to be widened. We need to do that as well so that India has greater benefit of a vibrant society. And finally, the macroeconomic uh, stability has got to be maintained. It is only because of that that our FDI flows kept coming. 
and macroeconomic stability is the one which gives you the strength of your economy moving forward even when very many developed countries are struggling. What are those which go into the macroeconomic indicators which whose stability is important for all of us? Low inflation, continuously maintaining inflation within the tolerance band, lesser fiscal deficit. Again, I would like, like to take this opportunity for many people saying, you run the economy too tight, you're not giving money to the people. No, give a lot of money to the people, but I still have to manage the deficit. I can't borrow and borrow and borrow, which many countries did. Either they borrowed or they printed their notes and flushed the economy with it during the COVID time and they are just not able to get them back on rails even today. So, with apologies, we, we continue to loosen, but there is a limit. I can't really be doing a morally good duty of running an economy if my deficit balloons. It ballooned in COVID and there was no thinking about it. Because we needed that to, you know, spend. But it has to come back to some kind of a normative position. And that is why uh, talking about uh, deficit, fiscal deficit, because we've given ourselves a chart. We will be this by this year, this by that year, and it has been approved by Parliament. I can't obviously go and say, sorry, no, I've been accused of running the economy tight, so I have to loosen it out now. I will not obey that light path which has been approved by the Parliament, sorry, and walk out. I can't do that. I will have to continuously make sure that the fiscal deficit is also managed well. Otherwise, your country is not going to be seen as a responsible democracy. You, you will just be like many of those countries which printed books. And narrow current account deficit. We need to have a current account deficit maintained well. So in all this, I have specified the individual markers, but how all these can be managed is by continuously having your stress on investment. Innovation is a big thing and that is why the story of the startups is a big success. More and more innovation, more and more patent registration, more and more speedier giving patents rather than sitting years over it. All this matters. So investment will have to continue, particularly in the uh, capital building, asset building and not on revenue expenditure. Innovation is what is going to make our economy far different from many others because innovation creates a lot more ripple effect in the economy in terms of jobs, in terms of the uh, you know, cost of making things, in terms of those innovative ideas with which you're giving newer solutions to it. Then, I already spoke about inclusion. We need to have inclusivity in what we do. And infrastructure has to be developed. Finally, inclusiveness. So, investment, innovation, infrastructure, and inclusiveness are the four eyes which I will have an eye on constantly. So there can be many other dimensions of uh, you know those which question the economy, the external risks, and so on. And uh, here I like to again touch upon a few things which we've done for India to be Atmanirbhar is where we have underlined in the latest budget that we need to have good critical supply of critical minerals. The rates of customs duty have all been brought down. We need to be self-sufficient in producing a lot of things, inclusive of your storage battery capacity, your renewable, renewable energies, uh, I mean the capacity is increasing. We are also talking about energy security and therefore we are coming up with uh, Bharat small reactors so that we can bring nuclear energy, but in a smaller scale and everywhere we are able to get energy supplies ready. And for which we need to have the right kind of minerals which we need. Duties have been cut so that these can come in and we are able to do a lot more uh, research and come up with products which will give us that energy security. Manufacturing will have to be diversified, more and more diversified so that we have the strength that the 
economy derives from agriculture and ag products, derives from secular services, which is already contributing more than 50, in fact 60 percent. The middle is the one in which a lot of work has to happen, and that is manufacturing. We need to have manufacturing's contribution to our GDP increase. Otherwise, you are only dependent on a agriculture whose growth will have to be even more pumped up, but largely relying only on services. That alone cannot help us. We need to diversify. We be a lot of attention for it. You know for the semiconductors, for the various PLIs, 13 sectors, I'm not getting into details of that. You all know about it. And I guess there will be an interaction as well. So you can ask me more questions on it. But the point that uh, Anand was saying, I'd like to give you one or two more data there. there. Uh, India's demand for semiconductors is projected to grow five-fold to around 110 billion US dollars from the current 24 billion dollars. It is that demand for which we need to have more semiconductor manufacturing happening in this country. And the five proposals which have come to this country in Assam, in Gujarat, and now Maharashtra is also uh, making an attempt, 1.52 lakh uh, crore investments in the five projects are likely to happen, which are all around it. Electronics exports, has quadrupled. In uh, 2014, it was $7.6 billion. Today, it is $29.12 billion. Electronics export it could not have happened if the policy was not an illegal. Similarly, smartphones has reached 76 times than what it was in 2014. 1,556 crore. Today it has touched 1.2 lakh crores. Uh, mobile phone production increased 20 times, where it was uh, somewhere 18,000 crores in 2014, 15, 18,900 crores. Today it is 4 lakh 10,000 crores of mobile phone productions in the country. So similarly, our defense exports have increased 30 times. Uh, it was just about 686 crore in 2014, just 21,013 crores in 2024. We have crossed even 1 lakh crore approximately. US $12 billion of different production has happened. So with all this, there is a lot of infrastructure investment which we want to spend on. And uh, I will assume that many of this is already discussed a lot. I won't take more of your time and give you time for the interaction. I just want to highlight for a Sashakt Bharat, for a Surakshit Bharat, and a Bharat which has to become Vikasit by 2047, we need to be sure that domestic economic levels of our citizens will have to be improved. They have to be lifted from where they are today to a higher level. Better living standards, better economic you know, access to materials, opportunities and so on. Because I would want to, just as I spoke about national security priorities of many countries which were neutral until recently, I want to highlight how some global funding organizations are continuously disturbing global peace, country by country. Just recall that Yugoslavia in 2000 saw the bulldozer revolution. You saw Georgia with the rose revolution in 2003. You saw Ukraine going through the orange revolution in 2004. You saw the tulip revolution in Kyrgyzstan in 2005. Then you saw the velvet revolution in Armenia in 2008. So, the reason why I'm bringing this into the context of economic well-being of our citizens will have to be enhanced. People will have to have better opportunities. They will have to have their families moving on the economic ladder. Is because prosperity unites, whereas poverty divides. Where there is continuous poverty or where there are sections which are vulnerable because of the economic condition, you will have all these unsavory forces 
finding a anchor there and in general disturbed economy we need to have a sashakta bada we need to have empowered empowered economically empowered citizens so that their opportunities improve and they build on hope yes i had this 10 years ago but i'm today here and i see hope to improve we need that building on people's hope and delivering on it otherwise you have forces which can happily breed on small discontents in some areas slightly major discontents in some other areas and they shall be instead we need to look at such the shakt bharat as as well as aiming at a samrat bharat and in that quickly i want to highlight the aging crore people which i already said about the in kalyan yojana 10 crore women provided free of cost gas connections under the ujwala yojana 12 crore household toilets built under the swachh bharat mission 21 crore rural households electrified under saubhagya scheme 4 crore pakka houses built for poor under the pm awas yojana rural and urban 12 crore households provided with tap water connection 13000 jan aushadhi kendras which are selling medicines which if your monthly budget was somewhere like 1500 today you can spend 600 or even lesser and get the very same medicines but the generic ones and that has helped a lot of low income families to see that they can get a relief nearly 1900 medicines are covered in some are life saving medicines as well and 300 surgical instruments are also available at discounted because at discounted rates so all this together with 35 crore aishman bharat cards and uh, providing 10 crore families relief through that and the recent announced we made sure that the rules were notified for all <coughs> citizens about 70 years of age to be given medical insurance and there we are not looking at poor rich or middle class or not middle class 70 uh, uh, plus 70 and above get medical insurance so all these are happening with a lot of emphasis on convergence across governments state center collaboration between civil society and government and competition so right at the beginning i said we look at outcomes we are not saying i've given this much money it will happen we are giving money we are also monetary so most often this question remains overall welfare expenditures come down no it has not come down very quickly at that the nominal gdp has grown by about 9.5% compounded annual growth cgr between 2017-18 to 2023-24 overall welfare expenditure has grown at 12.8% nominal gdp at 9.5 whereas uh, overall welfare expenditure has grown uh, at 12.8 between the same year 1718 to 22 23 24 expenditure on health has a cgr of 15.8 overall nominal gdp growth is only 9.5 and spending 15.8% on health for the same period and expenditure on education has also grown at 9.4 percent closer to the uh, nominal gdp growth so with all this i just want to be concluding to say india is a non aggressor nation it is never never aggressed on somebody else we have always extended a friendly gesture to a, through the vice <coughs> vaccine maitri to the covid operation samudra setu when you had to bring students when you had to bring in people who were caught up in war like situations so i repeat one line nations cannot be secure in isolation a symmetric pursuit of national interest by few countries can cause imbalance globally and we have to be ready to face any such a situation so our economy has to be strong the middle and the small uh, enterprises the msmes micro small medium enterprises have been given eight different kinds of uh, schemes all of which
which have come out of stakeholder consultation. We have not decided that we want to do it like this or do it like that. What was asked by MSMEs, we have provided in the budget. Greater awareness of all the schemes will give greater traction for our economy. Thank you very much.
to that company and its various uh, you know layers to which it manufactures what it produces and therefore you probably will become better employable and stand a chance in the job market. So that is one of the schemes for which internship is the word that we use. There are skilling uh, centers through the government ITIs which exist in every state in which we shall invest in money so that they can have such equipment through which training and skilling in AI will happen for young people. So the new growing area is artificial intelligence. We do not know how many of our young people are ready with skills for it. They will be trained for that. Other than that, through the EPFO, Employees Provident Fund organization, where a company wants to recruit a few more people, the government will pay the employee share of Provident Fund and the employer share of Provident Fund also so that new people unhesitatingly can be taken up uh, for recruitment by companies which need them. So there are many announcements in this budget about which I didn't take your time. <coughs> Ma'am, a quick question about the government has been very insistent on moving towards the electric vehicles and there is a target set as well. Um, and you've talked about, you know, uh, uh, making allowances, allowing uh, uh, critical elements, etc. But one aspect of it is, of course, the ecosystem building, charging infrastructure, etc. Can we expect significant announcements from the government coming? There's a lot of attention being given for EVs. We believe the future of public transport and personal transport will also depend on EVs. Uh, policy support and also infrastructure is something which we are working on. So in continuation with uh, artificial intelligence that you spoke, a lot of technology is coming from US. So are we also investing to build it from India so that the next generation technology comes from us through the research from India? So many startups can benefit from this. Of course that work is going on and the Anusandam push for which we have announced a lot of money uh, as seed capital is being used, the Department of Science and Technology is also working together with the industries to see how and NASCOM is playing a big role, in a big role in this. Good afternoon, madam. First of all, let me thank you for accepting the invitation to come here and spare so much of time of your valuable time here with us, explaining so many things about what the current administration and government is doing, all for our welfare for our good and for a Vixit model, which is going to be probably, I mean, we're going to achieve it in 20, 2047 under the leadership of, uh, uh, and to achieve this dream of our Honorable Prime Minister, I seek your advice as to what we should do as, our, as conscious citizens to kind of achieve this dream even earlier if possible. Thank you. See, whilst I appreciate your question, I can also see, please talk. I can also see why voices of, you know, pain are being put out, saying too much of tax, middle class is suffering. I quite recognize that. And as middle class, I know even, I'm not, uh, I may not agree with that one line you said, that if I pay my tax, I've done my duty. Maybe by paying the tax also, they are setting an example that despite the difficulties and challenges in which they live, because they are also expected to pay tax, because they come in the bracket, they are paying. So as an honest taxpayer, I respect them. I tr truly honor them because it's not always possible for middle class to seek very many other subsidies for which the schemes don't include them. So I do understand the pain with which voices come out. We'll have to work for it. But equally, as you ask this question, there are ways in which all of us can contribute towards bettering our people in the in our immediate neighborhood or by building a lot more. Nowadays, the tools in the digital world are all available for us. Many positive messages, both from the society, like the people who get Padma Award, are doing brilliantly, not expecting an award, but they thankfully are getting awarded nowadays because Prime Minister makes it a point to recognize unknown people from different parts of the country to, you know, recognize them for their positive. 
like that, if each one of us can spread the good messages and seek everyone to participate in this large, what I would call a yajna, to build this country, it will be a great service. Good evening, ma'am. Myself, Tamana Ambala. I have a question for you. A lot of Western countries are on a verge of recession, like Japan and UK. Is there any chance that we might see India in that position? If yes, what would be the causes for that? No, no, I don't think we are in a position going towards recession at all. Ma'am, what, what if? What if? Because like uh, we don't know like uh, America, UK and Japan. They are all the Western countries who had uh, established their economy a lot further than us. First thing, I want you to have confidence in the government. We will make sure, just as we made sure that the economy comes out well out of COVID, if situation, we will apply our mind and work. But at the moment, I want you to be confident that India is not moving towards any recession. On the contrary, we are the fastest growing. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Uh, um, for the sake of nation building and also in the spirit of the title of the literature festival, Bharat Shakti, I remember uh, in the parliament once this was read out, where they said that India, which sure in the road, that India is sure, I'm not paraphrasing, I'm just giving you the gist, that India is sure to become a superpower in politics, in economics, in democracy. But in the process, it should not lose its spiritual heritage. And then he mentioned in the bottom, and that will surely not happen. I want to know in the financial outlook, how much of focus and energy is put in the field of art and culture so that that can also thrive simultaneously with the well-being of the people. Well, we make sure that we are able to sustain all the artists. There are still a lot of them since COVID. Which, uh, whose voices are heard saying they still have on the front of uh, COVID. But otherwise, there is a lot of interest in studying the academy. We also encourage the cultural uh, richness of India through various festivals. I take the example of uh, a Krishna Nadi based uh, Telugu music, which the Tourism and Culture Ministry launched last year. Uh, there is also another which is happening in the name of Kannada, a lot of uh, uh, literature plus music uh, emphasis being given there. Many of our archaeological sites are given priority. In Tamil Nadu, for instance, Adit Chanadur is something on which government of India is spending a lot of time and money. So did we hold rock cut uh, cave temples of Tamil Nadu. The southern Tamil Nadu exhibition was held in Madurai. There is one plan for uh, the northern parts, central and northern parts of Tamil Nadu, rock cut temples exhibition. We are taking students to these sites and telling them how to, you know, appreciate them. Uh, yes, there are quite a lot. And I uh, also uh, must say it here, Prime Minister Modi has invested a lot of his own time and also the contacts that he talks with the Prime Ministers of different countries in restoring many of our artifacts, temple, vikrahas and you know sculpture, which have been stolen from this country and taken out. They are all being brought back like never before. And that is because Prime Minister believes there are assets. Either they have come back to the So we have to end the question and answer session now, because that's what we've been advised. Alo. Director of Pondi Lit Fest will now give her vote of thanks. Uh, thank you so much for coming and accepting our invitation. Uh, when I am ever told to speak or even understand the world of finance, I have this reflex that I do not know anything. But then I realized that uh, actually. Uh, I know the world of finance where probably this audience does not understand as much and uh, that is because of the work I do and the two ladies sitting there. Um, 
I have been associated with the farm where the suicide rates were among the highest in India in the 1960s. And I uh, document uh, interventions for an NGO that believes in empowering through skill development. So by just what I have seen in the last 50, 20 years, I can see the change in India. And uh, I do not need to listen to the noise on social media created by the 2% who maybe rightfully demand that the income tax burden should be reduced. But when the lockdown was announced, and when the free ration was announced, I ran to my sister and I said, you know, if you're a red ration card holder, you're going to get free food. And so she reached out to all the workers who come to the farm. It's a national farm. And she said that. We had a girl from the dairy tell us, Amma, we are no ration, ration card holder to the village anymore. So that is a change I have seen on the ground. Uh, I and, and that is a change that I have seen, uh, I have experienced completely. Similarly, um, when we intervene in the streets and slums of Pondicherry, uh, when we, uh, we are the liaising unit that links a beneficiary to an ITI and from an, uh, from a family of first generation school goers, when they acquire a skill and I ask them how many meals on the table before this happened and how many meals on the table after, I see the difference. So I am in no doubt whatsoever, maybe I will not be able to talk to you about deficits and subsidies and incentives. But with my connection to the people on the ground, thankfully because of the work I have opted to do, I know this change in India. And for that, I have to thank you and for the work you do. Thank you so much. Before I end, I would like to uh, acknowledge two people. Without Vikram Sampat and Anand Raghunathan, uh, we would not have uh, the platform of PLF would not have been placed with your presence. So I thank you from both from the bottom of my heart for facilitating this.